So hi, uh, we're going to start with our discussion on financial statement analysis of DMART, uh, Avenue Supermarts, as it is known as. And uh, during the next uh, few minutes, we'll try and decode this business, look at the numbers of this business and try and understand how, uh, you know, what parameters are doing well, what are not so well, and, you know, how does the business kind of stack up? So in the process, we'll try and understand how do you do financial analysis for a retail company? What are some of the core parameters that you want to keep an eye on when you're looking at retail companies? And how do you analyze a business as such? FSA forms the backbone of what you're going to go and then do in valuation. A lot of the times people tend to kind of go into valuation exercise without understanding the business and the company in too much detail. I think that's a mistake because eventually your projections are going to depend on how well you understand the business. And that's a key ask if you were to ask me that, you know, first step is basically understanding the business. If you understand the business well, it is easier for you to then make projections in the future. You also know where you have to be careful because what are the spots that you understand in the business and what are the spots that are kind of blind spots in the business. So whatever you do in finance and to an extent in consulting, understanding of financial statements of a company is one of the core critical parameters that you will be judged on, you will be gauged on, and you will basically be sort of, uh, you know, building a career on essentially. So that's what we are going to do here. Uh, once again, very quickly, this is uh, not to be treated as a recommendation of any form, right? So data has been used from publicly available sources and uh, the content does not imply any kind of recommendation. So please do your own research before uh, uh, embarking on any kind of investment advice from here. This is not to be an investment advice. This is purely from an academic interest perspective, trying to decode a company and its business. So let's understand the retail business and key pointers around it. Right. So the first thing we would basically understand about retail as such uh, in terms of a business is that uh, remember a retail company is basically buying products and selling products. They're giving their shelf space for it. Uh, DMART is predominantly a brick and mortar player. Their online business has just sort of started coming up now. Right. So in our analysis, we will uh, the e-commerce bit has just kind of started coming up in multiple cities for a long while. It was only in Mumbai. And then they expanded it first to nine cities. Now, if I'm not wrong, it's about 17 to 20 cities at this point of time, but not very old and does not contribute a very large amount of revenue to their overall top line, right? So you'll focus predominantly on their brick and mortar business, which is their mainstay at this point of time. They are a pure play retail player. Retail as a business is generally a low margin business, right? You're buying somebody's product. You're selling somebody's uh, that same product on your shelf. The final price is usually defined. That's the MRP. And usually because of the hyper competitive nature, you have to actually sell it at lower than that. So it's a wafer thin margin that you're basically betting it on, right? The other thing that is tricky about retail or important about retail is just imagine how do you go about purchasing anything under the retail industry? Imagine you're going to buy a shoe, for example, you go to a store, you like the shoe, you like the design, but they do not have the size for your foot at that point. Most likely, in 99% of the cases, you would go to another store, you will like something there, you'll buy it, and then the deal is done. Most of the retail purchase is there and then. So the critical aspect of ensuring that sales is not lost is inventory management. Right? And that's the, that's the holy grail in retail, essentially. Uh, especially more relevant for a company that sells food products because food tends to be a bit perishable. And so you can't have too much inventory and you can't have too little inventory. Too much inventory will mean that you will lose out on, you know, you will basically end up sort of uh, wasting a lot of it. And too little inventory would essentially mean lost sales at various points of time. So inventory management is absolutely critical in this business. Low margin, how many times can you repeat the business is what defines how good you are. Right? You have to basically, you're taking a water bottle and selling it. How many times can you do it is going to define uh, how good you are. Right, So that multiple turns of the inventory is what you are basically looking at. Right, Let's talk a little bit about DMART very quickly. So DMART had a beginning in about the early uh, part of 2000s, uh, starting I think their first store around 2000, 2001. Uh, they had two stores in 2002, 3. Took about eight years or so to get to their first 10 stores. Currently, they are operating at about 324 stores as of end of last financial year. As of now, 
uh, Feb end, I think they have 354 stores at this point of time, predominantly spread on the western, southern and central regions of India at this point of time. They have not spread on the northern, eastern and northeastern parts of India at this point of time. So there is ample scope that exists in terms of growth. Even within the states they are in, their predominant concentration is in Maharashtra, where they have about 100 stores. Gujarat, another 50. So 150 stores plus are in these two states itself. Then uh, Telangana, Karnataka, Andhra are the next three. And then there are a bunch of states where they have somewhere you know between 5 to 20 kind of stores that are there. So ample scope of growth in terms of that as well. Right. They have been of late adding about 30 to 40 stores a year on average. So we'll see that trend as well as to how that has played out and what's the relevance of that in our discussion. What do they sell? Predominant amount of their product sale includes 56% is about foods, groceries, staple, processed foods, etc. Uh, Non-foods, FMCG is about 20% or so, 21 now in this year. And uh, apparel and general merchandise is about 23%. So one fourth is apparel and general merchandise. About one fifth is uh, non-food FMCG and 55, 56% is uh, food FMCG. Uh, stellar growth over the past few years, 10 year sales growth, compounded sales growth is about 29%. Profit growth is about 38%. They have not been listed for, uh, they have not been listed for uh, more than seven years. I think 2017 was the IPO. So you don't have the, 10 year number. The seven year uh, CAGR I was seeing today is about 30%. And this is from their listing price. Uh, the IPO was at about 299. The stock listed around 600. So from 600, if you look at today's price, that's a 30% CAGR. If you got an IPO allotment, that's roughly about a 40% CAGR from a seven year time frame perspective, approximately. So has done really well in terms of the data. Uh, all of the data is picked up from the annual report or from screener. So the charts that you see are all annual report and the tables that you see, some of them are screener and all. Very quickly, their PNL numbers. So if you look at their PNL, the sales in 2012-13 was about 3,000 odd crore. That's gone up to approximately 42,000 crore in the latest financial year, right? Last financial year. And uh, operating margins used to be in the range of 6%. Remember, we said low margin business, but as the business scaled up, margin started going towards 8% kind of numbers. Profit, which used to be about 89, 90 crores is now close to about, you know, this profit before tax, sorry. So profit, which was 60, 70, and then 90 crore next year is now about 2,300 crore at this point of time as we speak, right? So that's the construct of uh, their business that you would want to kind of look at and understand as we go along, right? Bunch of other things that would come up, but before we go there, let's now try and turn our attention towards the, uh, towards the, Excel file, which we are going to use for our discussion. So there's a file here, which has all the data fed in for them for the last eight years. And what you see on the screen is the balance sheet data. Just a very quick skim through of the balance sheet data. You will see the size of the balance sheet towards the end. Total assets are now getting close to about, uh, just give me a second, close to about uh, 18,000 odd crore, right? Uh, Beginning of the period where we are looking at 3000 crore or so are the assets that we see. Within this framework, you will see that a uh, couple of things will catch your eye that out of the overall 18,000 crore of liabilities that you see or assets that you see, equity itself is close to about uh, 16,000 crore. So no real debt that the company has. If you look at borrowings, they used to have borrowings of about 1000 crore till 2017. And then post their IPO, which was in 2017, you will note in 2017, there is this other equity component that spikes up and share capital kind of goes up. That's where the, IP, that's where the IPO happened. Post the IPO, they repaid the debt. In 2020 financial year, there's another spike. If you see in the other equity, they, they did a qualified institutional placement around this time, right? So QIP was done. They raised another 4,000 odd crore at this point. Uh, immediately post which Corona struck. So that money was actually available with them for a while. I think they've now kind of used it uh, in that sense, right? Reasonably strong cash flow generating business. There is no real receivable in this business if you think about it. So you'll see trade receivables is a very small number, right? Uh, retail wouldn't have receivables, right? You pay before you sort of go ahead and uh, get the product or 
while you are getting the product. So that's not the key, key there. Uh, the larger element would be inventories and the largest component on the uh, on the side of their assets would be non-current assets, predominantly into plant property and equipment. That also tells you that uh, bulk of their stores are owned. They buy their stores. And there's this general thought process that, you know, the uh, because they buy their stores, uh, it makes them super competitive. While yes, that is an advantage because they don't have to focus on rent and all. Uh, it's not necessarily the only reason why uh, why they would be doing well. Honestly, I think uh, if it was only real estate, then that's a replicable strategy, one. Second, if you just look at their total asset value, non-current assets are about 12,000 odd crore. Their market cap is close to, you know, uh, 2.7 lakh crore. So practically, uh, and most of this has come in the last few years. So it's not like it's being carried at some historical cost. Right, it's all added in the last uh, five six years. So this is probably at close to market price. Maybe another twenty percent markup is what you can do to this real estate that they have. So even though they own the stores and it gives them a lot of freedom in terms of uh, lack of rent and all, this is not necessarily their core competitive advantage. I mean, it's obviously a benefit to do this, but uh, it's not a strategy that cannot be replicated. Right. So we'll come to that as we go along. Let's look at the PNL very quickly. So you'll see sales 8,000 odd crore going up to 42,000 crore. Bunch of things. The largest cost you will see is purchase of stock in trade. Basically for a trading business, you'll buy products and sell products, right? So that's what is purchase of stock in trade essentially. And then the second largest cost that you see is other expenses, which will include all kinds of other overheads. But your predominant uh, sort of cost is uh, is purchase of stock in trade. That's where bulk of your business is kind of uh, defined and that's running there. Right. Uh, then we have profits uh, from their PNL. We have calculated a few of the elements like what is EBITDA, what is EBIT, and what is PAT. Let's now turn our attention to the ratios. Right. Now there are a bunch of ratios that we'll try and cover. In this kind of a business, inventory is a very critical ask. So we're going to focus a little bit around working capital discussions as well. And then DMART actually releases a lot of data. So it'll be fun to see some of their business statistics and business data as well. Things like how many stores they have, what is the size of the store, has the size of the store been moving around or not, uh, how much do they do they kind of spend to open a new store, and so on and so forth. So we'll try and find all of that data from the data that is available. So let's start right away. Uh, ratios, uh, we are going to calculate. Now, I might be using certain set of definitions for the ratios. You do not necessarily need to agree to those definitions. I am myself not a very big stickler for definitions of uh, ratios. Just keep in mind two things. One, ratios, the, the the formula you're using should be consistent and it should be used uniformly across your spectrum of companies or the history of the company that you're using it. Don't change the definition in between. Otherwise, if you tweak it a little bit here or there, that's okay, right? So we'll start with operating profit margin. I'll also quickly write the formula, EBITDA upon sales. We have calculated EBITDA here. That's 657 divided by sales from op never, you know, revenues from operation. So that's this number, right? Done. Let's calculate net profit margin. So net profit or profit after tax divided by sales. This number is again available on the PNL. So that's profit for the year divided by revenue from operations, right? So we have these two converted to percentages uh, at a decimal point. Let's pull it on the right side. You'll see that uh, operating margin has been sort of very steady, slight uptick with the exception of financial year 2021, which you can attribute to Corona, right? That was the financial year in which you had one quarter of a lockdown and that must have caused uh, a part of this challenge that might have kind of come up, right? Similar to net profit margin, slow, steady increase, five, five and a half percent is where they are. And it seems like that's where they have stabilized at this point of time. Let's look at return ratios, return on equity. So this is net profit divided by shareholders equity, total value. And then we'll use net profit divided by, I'll use just total assets here. You can use average as well. As I said, I'm not a big stickler for definitions. You can choose to use average, but honestly, if you're doing it across years, uh, it'll automatically arrange itself, whether you take averages or year numbers, right? So I'm gonna take uh, PNL net profit divided by the balance sheet, uh, equity attributable, uh, attributable to the equity holders of the company, that's ROE, and 
Return on assets, again, you could use a bit upon uh, uh, total assets. That's generally a slightly better indicator. Uh, but given that they don't have debt, you could actually use uh, profit divided by total assets, which is here, right? So that's, again, a percentage number. We will add a decimal point. Let's drag it on the right side. So we see this return on equity obviously has gone down because they've raised equity in between. So you'll see 2017 ROE dipped because IPO happened. And the moment IPO happened, uh, equity increased. And so consequently, you saw a dip on ROEs. And then again, 2020 ROE sort of uh, dipped a bit because they raised equity there as well. And equity kind of went up in the denominator and uh, that resulted in the drop essentially, right? As they keep using this money, ROEs again start sort of going up. I think 15% odd is where their steady state return on equity is, and that's where they are. Again, you will also see that their assets ROA will drop in the years where they have basically done a capital raise or where they are doing expansion or something of that sort. Ignore 2021 because they were one of the hardest hit in that sense. That one quarter was kind of knocked off. And even after that, they were only selling, uh, uh, if you remember for a while, they were only allowed to sell essential goods. So general merchandise and apparels were not selling on the stores, right? Then we go to receivable turnover ratio. Now here I use a definition where I use sales in the numerator for all of these ratios. So sales by receivables, right? Sales upon inventory and sales upon payables. It's just easier to compare when you use sales. So I can quickly go and look at sales and divide this by the receivables where the receivables Let's go up here, uh, trade receivables, here we go. So that's done. Let's look at sales by inventory. So let's quickly look at inventory, inventory, inventory is here, 660. And let's look at payable turnover ratio. Once again, very quickly sales by payables. So trade payable should be on the other side. That's here, trade payables, right? Let's remove this. I can put it on the right side. Of course, receivable turnover ratio will be large because uh, receivable is a very small number. We can also convert this into days notation, right? How do you convert this into days notation? You can divide 365 by the turnover ratio. That basically tells you how many days worth of sales will be required to recover the money that is stuck in any of these, right? So for example, if I take 365, and I divide it by receivable turnover ratio. I do the same here, I do the same here. You will note something very interesting, right? And that something very interesting is with respect to receivable days, you basically have one day worth of sales outstanding as receivables, right? Inventory is where you will see something phenomenal that roughly about four weeks of inventory is what they hold. 2021 financial year is the Corona year. They had to hold a little bit because their stores were open for a certain time and people were buying more. Went to, you know, sort of started declining and back to the uh, back to the older uh, sort of regime that uh, they were, right? So this is what we'll talk about in a little bit more detail as we go along, but practically four weeks of inventory in terms of sales. So whatever is their inventory, when they sell it, it takes about four weeks of sales to sort of recover that money, which is stuck as inventory in that context, right? Payables also super steady. Eight days, seven days last year was actually even better. They, they are paying their suppliers within a week. And that probably explains the reason why they get some of the best deals, because uh, if you're going to pay your suppliers in a week, the supplier is going to be very happy about it, right? Cash conversion cycle is receivable days plus inventory days minus payable days. So roughly about 20 days is what we see. Went up in the beat in the years in between. So let's call this as receivable turnover ratio, 365 by inventory turnover ratio, 365 by payable turnover ratio. That's what we have done. Cash conversion cycle is basically receivable days plus inventory days minus payable days is what we have done in this scene. So 
basically how much time does it take for them to sort of recover their money that is outstanding in terms of uh, in terms of these uh, current assets uh, essentially they have to fund their business for 20 days right they take about 28 days to make the sale and a day to collect this collection is immediate but they're making the payment after about seven days so in between for about 21 days they have to kind of focus and keep that in that order right so that's the construct with respect to some of these data points that are there debt to equity ratio is you can take total borrowings so if i go on the balance sheet i can look at uh, current liabilities borrowings plus non-current borrowings let's put all of this in a bracket and because we are doing this from the balance sheet i can just divide from the equity attributable to this but if you're doing it in real life you can as well try and do it on the market cap as well although the number has become zero now right so it started there and went to zero interest coverage will also be similar you will see some finance cost honestly but this finance cost is not because they have debt this finance cost is more because there is a lease accounting that has now started happening so the discussion on the lease accounting is beyond the scope of what we are doing today but just if you're curious we can still calculate this as ebit ebit is here divided by finance cost which is here so any number more than three is absolutely fine i think they are doing super no problem here so pretty comfortable because there's no debt essentially and that's absolutely fine right now what you want to kind of focus on in some of these ratios is try and actually figure out what these trends are and how are they able to sort of manage it or maintain it right so for example why uh, are they able to essentially ensure that inventory is like 28 days at all points of time right those kind of things would essentially come into picture and uh, that would uh, that would kind of look at uh, as a premise of your looking at that data right uh, could you for example also include lease liabilities into this uh, into this calculation of uh, interest coverage or debt calculations you could the only problem is that uh, the way these lease liabilities are calculated are uh, it's more an accounting treatment than an actual payout essentially the actual payout is rent right so if you have like uh, out of their 300 stores if you have like 50 stores or 20 stores on rent the new accounting principles basically tell you that uh, you have to convert anything on an operating lease into a financial lease right just very basic plain english i'll explain it very quickly so what's happening is because uh, you are uh, you're paying rent so instead of putting that as a rent you have to classify it as uh, an asset on your books and that asset would have been purchased using a loan so on the asset side you have a right to use asset you'll see 2020 onwards this was a, this would have happened so you see a right to use assets on the asset side of the balance sheet and equivalently you'll have a liability lease liability on the liability side right so you've kind of classified it that way now uh, so what your earlier rental cost was has now gotten segregated into depreciation and interest cost essentially that's what has happened here right in terms of payouts you're still paying that rent right uh, it is a contractual obligation but generally a rental payment is considered before actual interest payment so the reason you are calculating interest coverage is if you have an external liability that has to be repaid from the ebit technically this amount has been paid before the ebit right it's just the accounting treatment is now slightly different and hence you are looking at it in that context understood so that's the premise that we are uh, basically i have excluded it you can feel free to add it as well that's absolutely fine right next up we have their gross fixed assets number now remember the balance sheet gives you the net value of fixed assets so when you see the fixed assets here this is on the uh, this is on a net basis depreciated value what you are looking at here is the gross value which has been picked up from the annual report so this is from the uh, notes to accounts from annual reports right i have picked it up what i'm trying to find out is what is their total fixed asset divided by number of stores right and somewhere on this sheet i also have put their number of stores here so what is the number of stores that are there are available here right just to get a sense that you know how much money does a store need so i'll add up both tangible plus intangible numbers and divided by the number of stores just to gauge what happens right so you'll get a sense here 
Remember, this is a cumulative number. So you're getting approximately and it's increasing, right? Which basically means that the cost per store is increasing. Uh, but it was 32 last year on average, 35 now. You would assume 40, 45, 50 is what they are spending on a store approximately. We can actually calculate that as well. Uh, when we calculate gross assets per square foot, we should be able to get that data as well, right? The premise there essentially is we are trying to uh, trying to sort of figure out how many stores are they opening? How many can they open, right? So there's some business data that is available here. Let's look at that quickly. This is given by the company, all of this, right? How many stores do they have? So I can subtract one year from another and find out what is the difference between the stores that are added. Right? How many, what is the area they have in million square feet? Remember, just the store is not going to help you. What if the store size changes? What if their stores are bigger or smaller than some other player? So you want to find out how efficiently you're utilizing the area that you are using. And hence, square foot area becomes an important ingredient in terms of your discussion of the retail industry as well. So you're now going to find out a bunch of things on area and square foot and all of that. There is also a data given about how many bills do they cut per store, total number of bills that are being cut. So how many people entered the store and you know basically bought something, swiped a card or paid through cash or whatever. Uh, number of bills cut are available. That will also give us some interesting insights as we go along, right? Now, let's look at a few interesting things here. First things immediately we'll also try and do is costs as a percentage of sales is something that we'll calculate. So the revenue numbers, I have pulled it here from the PNL just for ease of calculations. I will very quickly find out all the costs as a percentage of sales, sort of vertical analysis, uh, just to kind of get uh, a sense of what we are doing. So that's 85% employee cost as a percentage of sales is a small 1.7% other expenses as a percentage of sales uh, is this. Uh, in this business, you can also calculate some of these costs like employee cost and other expenses on a per square foot basis. That may also be a relevant uh, way to kind of look at it. So you'll see something very interesting here as well. COGS as a percentage of sales, cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales are almost to the T, it's at about 85% through this. So it seems like a very conscious strategy that they market up by 15 rupees. They buy a product worth 85, buy a market up by 15 rupees and sell it out, right? So that's what is happening here. Right. And uh, then there's some more cost here and look at this number as well. Both of these numbers also relatively steady. Seems 2021 employee cost increased as a percentage of sales. This is predominantly because I think 2021 sales were hit and then it again went back to that 1.7% number as sales picked up again. Correct. So leave out 2021 financial year because the business got hit because of Corona. But look at the trends outside of that. So they seem to be maintaining employee cost as a percentage of sales. There are two levers here. Employee cost will be inflationary in nature. So that will increase. But at the same time, as you keep increasing the size and scale, it'll sort of keep coming uh, down purely because you'll be expanding more in tier two towns. So there may be the cost uh, gets leveraged a little bit in that context. Plus, uh, you will also have technology for your help as you kind of keep expanding now onwards. So probably a little bit of uh, efficiency coming on account of that as well. So two levers at play, but I don't see that as such a big problem. Although you want to be a bit careful with retail business because, you know, they're working on thin margins. So one and a half percent becoming two and a half percent has a big hit on the EBITDA essentially. Want to be a bit careful with that. Other expenses, very steady. Five percent has actually gone down. I would continue to think that, you know, on a larger scale, uh, you do get some degree of operating leverage on that account, right? So that should probably play out as well. Let's turn our attention towards some of these business metrics that are there. Now, remember the area that they give is in million square feet. A lot of our other calculations are in crores. So when you do that, be careful about the conversions. So for example, if I want to do gross assets per store, uh, per square foot, right? Gross assets per square foot. So my gross assets are this plus this, but these are in rupees crore, right? And square feet is in million. So I multiply this with 10. When I multiply with 10, this becomes million. Now I can straight away divide it with the area in square feet. So you'll see about 6,500 rupees per square foot is the gross asset that was there. 
on a cumulative basis, this has gone up to somewhere about 8,300. If you read a little bit about it, they're probably spending 10,000 rupees a square foot on the newer stores that they are kind of opening. That will give us a CAPEX plan as well. So we can actually check how much CAPEX is required and do they need funding or can they accrue, use it using internal accruals itself, right? Let's look at some other business metrics. So I have bills cut in crore. I can actually look at this on a per store basis. So crore to be converted into actual numbers multiplied by 10 raised to 7 divided by number of stores. I'll tell you why I did that. We'll see that. Also, area per store in square feet. So I have the area in million square feet and I have the number of stores. So I can basically multiply the area with 10 raised to, uh, sorry, 6 because this is in million and divided by number of stores. 30,000 square feet on average per store in 2016. But here is what is interesting. If you see it going ahead, stores are becoming larger and larger. Correct, which means the newer stores they are op opening are larger and larger as you kind of go ahead, right? So then you are going to basically look at a little bit with respect to uh, what these stores are. Now look at what the new stores are. So every year from 131 to 110, they added 21 stores. Next year, they added 24. Next year, 21. Then 38, 20, 50, 40, right? Additional area they added in terms of square feet is also given because they are giving year and square feet area. So I know what is the new area added. So technically, if I just do this, this is a division of the new stores added. 21 stores is the denominator and 0.8 million square feet added is the numerator. So the newer stores, the 21 stores they added in 2017 on average had a size of 38,000 square feet. And when I drag this on the right side, you will see last few years, the stores they are adding have been in the range of 50,000 square feet or 54 or 47. But a ballpark on an average of 50,000 square feet store is getting added in the last few years. What did we do? We just took the additional stores that got added and we divided the additional million square foot area with the number of stores, right? Million square feet, of course, getting converted into this. So now I can find out what is growth in area per store and I can calculate growth metrics as that as well. You can check bills cut per store and expand that as well. Another interesting thing you will note here is bills cut per store were about 7 lakh per store. 8 lakh, 8.64 lakh, 9.77, 9.39 and then a sudden dip in the corona period. Of course, because one quarter was knocked out and uh, generally, even in the next year, you see that has not gone back to the earlier trends because the behavior changed. So there is a hypothesis here that people started visiting the stores lesser, but should have started buying more, right? We can test that thesis because bills cut are available. I can find out revenue per bill cut. Revenue is available and bill cut is available. So there is a line where we can calculate revenue divided by bills cut. And both are in crores. So I can just directly divide and note that what happens in 2021. You will note that in 2021, there is a spike. And interestingly, that spike does not come off. You would assume that if this was Corona induced, it should have come off. But what happened is that changed the behavior of people in terms of what they were purchasing. And then that behavior has continued after that. Minor dip this year, but is still higher than what 2021 was. Right? So it's still about 1600 per bill. So what's happening is people are visiting less often and hence lesser bills cut per store. But when they are visiting, they are buying more. So the tendency to buy more has happened in this process. Correct? I can also find out revenue per store, which is a straightforward calculation. Just divide revenue by number of stores, right? So that has gone from 78 to 132. But you have to be a bit careful with this growth because uh, uh, store size is increasing. So if store size is increasing, you will end up selling more, right? Bigger store, more sales. What is important is to figure out revenue per square foot. That is the core element that you want to kind of look at. Right, So revenue per square foot will be revenue. This is in crore. Multiply with 10. So you basically divided, you know, you've converted it to millions. 
Now just divide by the area, which is in million square feet. So you get revenue per square foot, 25,000. And if you expand it, went up to 33,000 in 2019. And since then has been sort of stagnant. A couple of years dip has gone back to about 32 last year. Right. So 30,000 odd rupees per square foot, 32,000 rupees per square foot is the revenue per square foot. The interesting bit is uh, if you go back and read their IPO prospectus, everybody else in the industry operates at about half of this number. So they're just super efficient in that context. Right. And that's a function of better inventory management. Growth metrics. How do I calculate growth? I'll take this year minus. Sorry. Let's change that. Okay. 63 minus last year divided by last year. So that's 39%. I can do that. I can pull it here. So I get a sort of a visual understanding of where is growth high, where is growth low. And you'll see 2021 is the year that things got distorted, but bills cut per revenue per bill cut is what went up. Similarly, I can just take this and put area per store growth. And that could be this divided by last year number minus one. So that's growth in area per store. So area per store seems to be growing on average over these years. And that's been another trend that is there. Uh, growth in bills cut can be calculated as this by this minus one. Bills cut per store. Again, a dip in 2021. And then since then has sort of not gone up as much. And we had one thing. Yeah. So that basically kind of defines most of the metrics or ratios we wanted to kind of calculate. Right. Now, with this in mind, once we have this information with us, there are a few interesting points about DMART that I would want to highlight. And I think one of the core reasons that differentiates DMART against other entities, what makes it a little bit special in that context, is if you actually were to look at their, uh, their, uh, uh, you know, gross margin. So they are basically 100 rupee sales, 85 rupee cogs. Uh, practically the gross margin should be, they're making 15 uh, rupees of gross profit. So 15% gross margin, right? 15% gross margin is what they're doing. To keep it simple, I will make uh, it as 100 and 115, right? So assume they are buying something, their cost of purchasing something is 100 and their sales is 115. They're actually doing better because it's 85 cost and 100 sales, right? But let's say they do this. So what is their gross profit is 15 in this case, right? I will assume a gross margin of 15%. So you invest and remember they are doing it every month, right? This is happening every month because their inventory turnover ratio is about uh, showing that, you know, it's turning inventory every month, 28 days of inventory essentially, right? So if they do it, let's say 12 times a year, once a month, they sell everything. So start the business with 100 rupees, buy product worth 100, sell it for 115. You get 15 rupees. Do this in the first month. Correct? You get 115. Remove the 15. You don't need to actually account for the 15. Do this again in month two. Do this again in month three. Keep doing it. Right? So your gross margin is 15%. And you're turning turning it around 12 times a year. You started your year with 100 rupees of investment. You would have ended the year with 180 rupees of additional profit on that. Right? That's the advantage they carry. So what is this called is essentially this is their gross margin. And this is their inventory turns. Now what makes them special or really special is if somebody has to compete with them profitably, right? You have to basically, how would you compete with them? Either you cut prices, right? To generate the same amount of profitability, if you cut prices, cross margin goes down. So you have to focus on increasing inventory turns. That's not so easy because this is like the most efficient in the first place. And if you are not able to basically run at that efficiency and your inventory turns are lower, then you have to somehow try and increase or keep gross margins higher. So you can't fight on price. So you can compete with them only if you're willing to bleed money. You can't do it profitably because they seem to be mastering this art of understanding who their customer is, what the customer purchases, when do they purchase that, 
and how likely are they to purchase that most retail firms in india tend to sort of you know go ahead the path of uh, put everything for everybody right dmart doesn't do that dmart says i know what my customer set is i know what they are going to buy and i will only offer that to them at the lowest possible price simple right and because of this razor sharp focus they have been able to sort of replicate this across stores the numbers just seem super steady across the period right and that's that's basically why uh, it's a simple thing but it's not so simple to actually execute it because when you're running the business to be able to know and predict your inventory and keep it consistent across 8 9 10 years at that kind of efficiency uh you need to be super sure of what the product catalog is and who's going to buy it and when they are going to buy it that level of understanding of the customer and their needs and the product requirements is what gives this kind of a differentiation to dmart right that in a nutshell is what our discussion on dmart was to be it's a good company it's a bit uh, sort of uh, you know expensive in terms of its valuation but just because it has grown at remarkable speed in fact it might be worthwhile to just quickly also calculate some other things like okay what is the cagr of sales and profit and all of that right remember how many years are there here there are 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 uh eight years but then you have to look at it in the context of seven years so if you have to kind of calculate a cagr cagr is final value divided by initial value raised to the power 1 by the number of years in this case seven years minus 1 so that's a 26% cagr over this 7 year period if you look at the same cagr on profitability that's 33% i can do that on ebitda ebit and profitability so super growth over this period that has resulted in substantial sort of uh uh movement and now going back to that idea that if they have like let's say they are going to spend uh you know uh they spending about 8000 rupees per square foot to open a new store assume they spend 10000 right take a little bit conservative estimate 10000 rupees a square foot to open a new store how much will have to be done so let's say store size is 50000 square feet right so 50000 square feet into 10000 rupees a square foot divided by 10 raised to 7 50 crore is their capex required for the next store the store that they put up they need about 50 crore to put it up what is their overall profit their profit is about 2300 crore correct to this you can actually add depreciation as well but even if you leave that out you're saying that you know with their profit alone they should be able to open roughly about 40 stores next year which is their run rate in any case right roughly about on average they are adding 40 stores over the last 4 years uh they've added about 30 till now this year so just their profits alone should be able to keep giving them an accrual of about 40 stores each year they could probably go up to 1000 stores in india plus i think if you look at the balance sheet there would be some investments uh in terms of financial assets that they might have uh not too much now they probably have used most of it now so about 400 odd crore is there they can they trade at 2.7 lakh crore they offload 1% equity they will be able to open another 50 stores with that so it is just such a sheer power now that they have that they can keep opening stores with their existing infrastructure the money that they are generating on it and those stores will generate more money because that profit keeps increasing if the profit keeps growing at the rate it is growing at every year add 50 70 odd stores keep adding it till the time it probably covers the entire country and reaches 1000 that's the growth story you are playing out for remember we have not talked about valuation valuation could be high low that's immaterial we are not talking about that we're just looking at their business and how they are kind of expanding that business looking at their numbers and trying to understand that that in a nutshell is what our discussion had to be with respect to dmart